church. In my grandma's church, the women did not wear makeup. They didn't believe in makeup, but they made up for it with perfume. So you could smell grandma's church. <laughs> you could smell it about a block before you got there. And you walk in and holy smoke, man, I mean, it'll knock you out. And so you go into this church and, and it's just different. The organ music is playing and the piano. And you go to your Sunday school class and everybody's sister and brother. And, and, and you go in there and it's very formal. And, and you sit in this beige folding chair. And you sit in a beige folding chair, and the floor is beige, and the walls are all beige. The ceiling's even beige. Everything in it is beige. And the guy gets up, and this guy, he really means well, but he reads to you out of the King James Bible for 45 minutes. And, and you're sitting there as this little kid. You're thinking, dear God, when is this ever going to end? <laughs> And, and, and then you don't understand what's going on in the main service. The preaching is very difficult to understand. It's just, and, and so anyway, nobody, nobody in the time that I went with my grandma, when I was 10 years old, nobody ever told me how to receive Christ. Nobody sat me down and said, Willie, have you heard the story of how Jesus died on the cross for you and how that God raised him from the dead and how if you confess him as Lord, he'll come into your heart and you'll be born again. Has anybody ever told you that? Nobody did that. You know why they didn't do that? because they thought I was too young. They thought that I was not able to understand. Now, let me tell you what else is going on in my house, in my life, when I'm 10 years old. That same time, one night, as I was laying in bed in this little apartment that we lived in, that was in a government housing project where our rent was adjusted by the government because we made so little money, my mother walks by the bedroom and looks at my brother and I, I'm 10, he's six, and she says, I don't know what's going to happen when they find me dead tomorrow morning. My brother was asleep. She thought I was. I jumped up and I ran after her. But when I got to the bathroom door, she'd passed out on the other side. I, I heard her body sliding down the door. And I said, Mama, why did you say that? Why did you say you're going to die? She said, Honey, I took a bottle of sleeping pills. I don't want to live anymore. I ran back to the bedroom, grabbed my jeans. I didn't even put on shoes, didn't put on a shirt because I was so scared. I had to get to my grandma's house. We didn't have a telephone. None of our neighbors had a telephone. And I ran barefooted across the north side of Fort Worth, Texas in the middle of the night to beat on my grandparents' door. I can still remember as a little kid standing in the curtains in the emergency room at John Peter Smith Hospital, listening to my mother's voice as she's talking, but they're ga she's gagging and they're, they're running tubes down her stomach and they're pumping her stomach to pull out the sleeping pills. About a month later, I came home. And it was one day after school, and the house was always cold and dark, but there was something different about that day. As I opened the door and started walking across the living room, there was blood on the floor. And there was more blood as it went down the hall toward that same bathroom. And when I went down the hall and started looking in that bathroom, there was blood all over the tub. And what I didn't know was that day my mother had slit her wrist and tried to commit suicide. And someone came by to check on her when she didn't show up at work, and they found her in the bathtub in a pool of blood, and they saved her life. I didn't know that. They just told me she was sick. So all during Christmas that year, my mother was in a hospital, and they were keeping her because she was sick. And it was only some time later I found out what she'd done. That happened like that time and again when I was 10 years old. But nobody at church thought that I was old enough to hear about Jesus. But Satan thought that I was old enough to monkey with my life. You know, many of you are still digging out of a hole that you fell into when you were 10 years old. When you were a little kid, you're still having to fight with issues that started when you were young. And somehow or another, we, we just somehow begin to think because we're so familiar with them that kids can't really know what they need to know about God. And so we underestimate what they're able to understand. And we somehow don't think that the devil tempts them like he does us. But if you stop and think, you know that he does because he wants to mark them as quickly as he can. And what this part of Jesus' ministry tells us is that children have real problems. Listen, you have to deal with kids differently than you do adults. And that's the reason a lot of people think, ah, oh, these kids, they don't know what's going on. But they do. They do. My little two-year-old girl, she's 22 now, but when she was two, between two and three, she came running in the speaker's room one day, and she bent over and she grabbed my Bible, and she started kissing it, just kissing my Bible and rubbing it and patting it. And she says, Bible, Daddy, Bible. And my wife had just come in from picking her up in the nursery, and I said, did you teach her this? She said, no. I said, where does she learn that? She got it in the nursery. I said, I got to see this. 
So the following Wednesday night, I went to this little two-year-old class, and I kind of snuck in there, and you can sneak in on little two-year-old kids, and they don't even know you're in the room, you know. And so I, I, I looked at them, and here's this teacher, and she's sitting in this horseshoe-shaped table, and she's talking to these little kids, and she's got all these little signs she holds up, and she says, boys and girls, this is Jesus. We love Jesus. And she's got this picture of Jesus' face on a stick. She's holding it around for all of them to see it, and all these little kids are blowing kisses at Jesus' face. Now, some of them don't know how to do it yet, so there's a couple of helpers, and they're bending over so that every little kid gets to blow a kiss at Jesus. Come on, take your finger, blow a kiss at Jesus. So they're blowing. We love Jesus, don't we? We love Jesus. Jesus gives us trees. Did you know Jesus makes trees? Jesus made the sky. He made the sun. He made the moon. Jesus makes puppy dogs. Jesus makes kitty cats. Jesus makes mommies. Jesus makes daddies. Jesus makes ice cream. <laughs> and they're teaching these little kids that Jesus is creator. And as I'm watching all of this, I'm thinking about this and I'm saying, whoa, that is an eternal human being. Although just two years old, this kid's going to live forever. And this kid's going to have hundreds of teachers before they quit learning. They will have hundreds of people teach them and talk to them through a lifetime. But nobody will ever be able to say, like this person can say, I was the first one to take an eternal human being and introduce them to Jesus Christ, creator of heaven and earth and all that in them is. And I presented them with that message. And I thought to myself, wow, how many people in our church out there in that auditorium think that these ladies are only babysitting. That's all they think about, that we're babysitting our kids. And these people are not. They're back there preaching the eternal word of creator God to our kids. And so when your little kids come out and all they can say is, I love Jesus, and they know something about him, somebody taught them the word, I want you to give a big hand clap to all of our nursery workers right now and all of our preschool workers. Thank you very much.